Hey everybody, do you remember your first boss or business mentor? Rich and I were fortunate to meet each other as peers in our first jobs out of college, and we were fortunate to have been mentored by our guest on today's episode, Jeff Wall. Jeff is currently the CEO and owner of Handyman Connection, a national franchise company with hundreds of franchisees across North America. And prior to Handyman Connection, Jeff had a long career of mentoring thousands of entrepreneurs within the First Service Brands organization. Jeff was incredibly instrumental in Rich and I's development as young entrepreneurs, and we enjoy revisiting some of the main principles that impacted our business careers in this conversation. Let's jump right into it. Hey, Jeff, welcome to the podcast. Hi, Rich. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Can you uh, get us started with, tell us a little bit about your entrepreneurial journey and how you've come to where you are now and a little bit about where you are now. All right. Uh, I grew up in the Chicagoland area and uh, like the earliest entrepreneurial stuff I can remember is going back to grade school where I sold those chocolate bars. And I remember selling a, a bunch of those things and the school fooled us by, by having a board as soon as you walked into the school like a rating thing. And I, I remember trying to get on that rating board and I, I got to like number three in the school as a, as a third grader. And uh, so, so I learned, first of all, the, the motivation of, uh, of putting out there a, 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 a rating as a third grader. And, uh, and then I did the, the, the normal stuff during, uh, during grade school, lemonade stand, all that good stuff, high school, normal jobs. Uh, college, I had a, uh, my first year of college, I had an internship at a major bank downtown Chicago. And uh, I remember I was a business major at University of Illinois, and I remember going back uh, probably two or three weeks into to my job. Again, I was going downtown LaSalle Street. I, uh, you know, this is back in, 19, I don't want to say how old I am, back in 1989. And uh, I, I had a window. I was going down on the train every day in suit and tie. It was a paid internship, and I remember coming home and telling my mom one day, I'm like, Mom, I hate this. And she's like, you hate what? And I'm like, I hate what I do. And she's like, you know what, Jeff, that's why they call it a job. And I'm like, well, Mom, I'm a business major. I don't know what I'm going to do my whole life. I, uh, I can't stand this. And uh, she didn't ask a ton of questions as far as the, the, the why I hated it. Uh, part of it was it was, you know, I had to get up early in the morning to get on the train. But, but the biggest thing was, is I, I felt like I didn't do much. You know, I, I, you know, not that I should have the keys to the vault, but um, I didn't have a lot of set. And uh, so I went back to college my, my sophomore year, <coughs> pardon me, and got a uh, flyer into the door my, in my dorm room that said earn 10 grand this summer. And uh, I thought it was a scam. And again, this is back before the internet. And so I, I sent back a, a, a business reply card in the mail and by, to find out more information about it. It was a company called College Pro Painters. And they were coming to Chicago for the first time ever. They were a Canadian-based company. I sat around and did a couple interviews. And again, uh, for, for those of you who, you know, so some of you, both John and Rich are ex-college pro people, so they know how these interviews go. But it was a, I was in a vacant apartment building doing an interview. And this person talked about my dreams and all the things that could happen. And they, uh, they put a, a franchise agreement in front of me. And I went home and I, and I was talking to my mom and my dad. And my mom was, was sitting there going, well, of course you're, you're not going to do that. That's, that's silly. That's stupid. That's a risk. It's a scam. And my dad looked at me and he's like, well, you know what? I read the thing. It's, uh, it's a lot of legal stuff. You know, you, you've always said you want to run your own business. And if you, uh, if you really want to do so, try. What do you got to lose? My mom hit my dad and, she, you know, she's crying. And she's like, don't do it. I, uh, I, I, and I, I, you couldn't check anything out on the Internet. And I think all of us have those moments where you're sitting there going, what should I do? We're all sitting around scared at some point, and you ask yourself that question, like, what do I do? Am I going to take this path or that path? And I did the logical thing and, and thought about it, and I was like, well, you know what? Do I have the guts to try this thing? And I, I, I had the guts and uh, ran a business for a couple years in college and, and loved it. Caught the entrepreneurial spirit, loved it. It was the best thing I ever did, and uh, that was the start of my entrepreneurial career. Talk to us about how that has evolved from 
college bro to what you do today and maybe even what some of your responsibilities are today? I, uh, I joined college pro full time after college. After running a business for a couple of years in college, I was uh, unique in the fact that I thought highly of myself. And uh, I, I thought more highly of myself than perhaps others did. So I interviewed for a lot of jobs and, and had, I uh, was quite opinionated on, on telling some of these companies, you know, how they should be running things. Uh, many of these were, were Fortune 500 companies that, uh, that, that thought my entrepreneurial spirit was great, but, but maybe that I wasn't as valuable as, as I thought I was. So, uh, so summer of, of after graduating, I was uh, sitting around doing nothing at home. Mom was not too impressed. And uh, College Pro Painters offered me a full-time general manager position. The, uh, the, the funny thing is, is I remember I earned 17 grand in the summer of 1991. So I, I thought, you know, I'm clearly I'm worth at least four times that. You know, if you're going to get me for three months and I can make 17 grand, clearly, you know, I'm worth at least $68,000 if you're going to get 12 months of my time. I, uh, I joined College Pro Painters for the starting salary of 23 grand. And uh, I was clearly off on my assessment of value. I, uh, I, I, I learned a lot. I spent 15 years full time with College Pro Painters moving up the ranks. Uh, College Pro Painters is owned by First Service Brands. I moved over to uh, a sister company at that point for a couple years, Certa Pro Painters, and then moved over to Handyman Connection in 2010, which was also under First Service Brands. And at the end of 2013, I purchased Handyman Connection out from First Service Brands. So now I, I am the sole owner of Handyman Connection. <coughs> Pardon me. Which is a franchise system that, that franchises handyman businesses across the U.S. and Canada. And you've been doing that, uh, I think, roughly 10 years now? Been with Handyman Connection for about 10 years. Yep. January 1st, 2010 was my, uh, my first, uh, first day on the job. So we're, uh, we're a little past 10 years. And this is the first company that you have owned 100% uh, as an entrepreneur yourself. Is that correct? Yes. I mean, prior with, with College Pro Painters, it was a franchise. So, you know, I, much like yeah. yourselves, I, I own the franchise, but I, I had to set to a franchise agreement. Can you speak to the, the, uh, a bit about the entrepreneurial journey that you've taken in being a sole owner of a company and how that's changed your perspective, maybe? I, uh, I was fortunate that I, uh, along the way, I, I work with many entrepreneurial type individuals. And, uh, you know, throughout the, the years, uh, the great thing about College Pro Painters was you, you learn skills and you met a lot of similar minded people who, you know, much like yourselves, who go out there and, uh, you know, have, have a killer edge to go out there and try to do new things. So I've been able to surround myself with a number of people over the years who have a similar background, a similar mindset. And so I, one of the things that I think has, has been important for me, particularly being on my own, is still continuing these relationships. Because, uh, you know, it, it, if I were to show you around the room, it's, it's, it's awfully empty, you know, at the, uh, the Handyman Connection corporate headquarters here today. So, uh, so having... Having peers and having people out there that you can bounce ideas off of that you trust has been probably one of the biggest things. Jeff, I want, I want to come back to College Pro because a lot of people don't know what College Pro is. I know in the United States, I don't think College Pro is here anymore. And for those who don't know what College Pro is, you know, the three of us had the opportunity to be College Pro franchisees, College Pro general managers. And I would say for myself, and I'm, I'm, I guess I'd be speaking for both of you guys as well, it was my business MBA. Uh, mm -hmm. Most of the things I've learned that I still use today in my career, I learned there. As a matter of fact, I learned from you uh, a big part of it as well. And I think people that have gone through the College Pro you know, cycle over the years have gone on to do great things. Like Elon Musk was a Sir Pro franchisee at one point I heard up in, up in Ontario. Not uh, Elon, his brother. His brother. Okay, so Elon his Musk. His brother. Brother, Right. So it just seems like the who's very, who, by the way, is very successful in his own right. Yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, a lot of people have come through that channel and you've had over the years, all these entrepreneurs coming through your really the development of not only sort of pro painters, but you also 
were really a professor, an MBA professor on how to run a business. And, and a lot of your you know, students, I'd say, or people like Rich and I have moved on to other entrepreneurial ventures. What have you seen as being the biggest key to somebody who came into Certa Pro, was successful in a Certa Pro, and then went on to bigger things? We know there's a lot of people who came into Certa Pro who just couldn't hack it, right? Didn't have the fundamental ability to get through those tough times, as we would call it back in the day. What, what, what do you think those key pieces were that differentiated the the people who got through that Certa Pro, M excuse me, College Pro MBA program and those who didn't? It, uh, we've always talked about uh, College Pro being the real world MBA. Yep. And the cool thing about College Pro, which is also the worst thing about College Pro, as you guys are aware, is they give you way too much responsibility at a young age. Mostly 18, 19, 20 year olds. And the great thing for the right individual, if you have that entrepreneurial mindset, if you have, and John, you just called it fundamental ability, and for those who don't, you know, with our background, it's the ability to regulate your mood when, when times are going tough, how are you going to react? Uh, the great thing about College Pro is that if you have some of those, number one, innate abilities, but also are open to the coaching that it is a platform for you to go out there and really show who you are. The dangerous thing about College Pro, in my opinion, is that if you're not the right person, if you are the type of individual who uh, works better with, uh, in a more structured environment in which somebody is giving you a lot of direction, it is a challenging position because you're given way too much freedom at too young of an age. <laughs> and the cool thing that we were able to see is we were able to see a, a, and again, you spend enough time with the company, you can see lots of changes, right? We're all gonna look back at, the, at some point in, in 2020 and go, I remember those changes in, in Zoom meetings. But what, what, what I saw over a period of time was, and again, when I started off, we were pre-internet. And we, so we were there before the term helicopter parents existed. And uh, all, all three of us are parents. Uh, the amount we are now involved with our children versus, uh, you know, versus 20, 30, 40 years ago has been a dramatic shift. And so one of the things that, that I saw, John, you asked the question, is like what, what made these entrepreneurs is, um, you know, a long time ago, there were more people who wanted, uh, who gave their kids the opportunity to go out there and fail. And there was a shift, and it was a shift, I don't know, there was, it, was a, it was a gradual shift, in which, you know, we've talked about it before, that, you know, everybody gets an award nowadays, and everybody's patted on the back, and there's no failing grades, and, you know, uh, you, you don't experience failure. And the cool thing about College Pro is that you could fail. And that failure is a motivation. Now, the challenge is, and then we all saw this at some point, is that sometimes mom and dad came in and tried to, to cover for you and swoop up and, uh, you know, protect the child. And when I say child, we're talking about 19, 20, 21-year-olds who, uh, who are more young adults. So the ability to, to go out there and really succeed and really have the opportunity to, to fail uh, was huge. And so, you know, when you, you ask the question, like, what are some of the fundamental things that, that, that drive people? Do you have that innate ability? I, I think that there is something out there that, that some people are more geared towards, whether it's entrepreneurial type of ventures or more structured type of business uh, adventures or ventures. Uh, there's certainly people that are more service orientated. And, uh, and so you get a vast array of different uh, qualities and qualifications and, and abilities and skill sets that people bring. So for the right individual, College Pro is awesome. Yeah. You know, it's funny, Rich and I were talking uh, prior to you joining the call today about some of the biggest things we've learned from you. Because, you know, again, very impressionable coming out of college, right? You were our first boss, both of ours, right? In the real world with a real job. And we spent a lot of time together um, and we learned a lot from you. And, and it's funny, I was asking Rich earlier, Rich, what's the biggest thing you learned from Jeff? Because uh, certainly, 
again, very impressionable. We learned a lot from you. And Rich, what was your response? What, what's the biggest thing you learned from Jeff in those years? Yeah, I'd say uh, what I said to John after thinking about it for a minute was number one is deliver what you promise. So if you say you're going to do it, figure out how to do that. And then with a strong side plate of tenacity to go with it. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that I learned, uh, and by the way, it, as you know, and you and I have had multiple times where I've thanked you for your business mentorship and where I've told you that uh, you've been my original business mentor and have provided me the, the foundation on which I've developed uh, the rest of my professional skill. Um, but the rock bed of that foundation being deliver what you promise. Again, mm -hmm. side plate of tenacity, but there's another side plate of, of be careful what you promise. Yes. Because if you promise that, you will be expected to deliver that. And I felt that as a bit of pressure as a 19-year-old and working with you um, as a subordinate, if you will, or as a learner. One of the ways that I use that now as a supervisor or a leader of others is I teach them the same principles that I learned at 19 from you. Be careful what you promise, because if you promise it, what am I supposed to expect? I expect for you to do that that you said you would do. And I expect you to figure it out on how to get that done. Why? Because you said you would. It's that simple. And there's, a, there's trust that can be banked uh, on people who consistently deliver what they promise. And I've tried to do that through my career since learning that from you, and I'm thankful for it. I appreciate that. And, and you know this, this, this isn't my foundation, right? It was a, it was a college pro uh, core value. And then you sit there and you go, how does that resonate with you, right? Because just because somebody tells you something and says you should do this, right? It you know, doesn't necessarily resonate with you. Uh, you know, a lot of times you get that from your parents, right? So, you know, I, I would always say, you know, if, if, if my mom said she was going to pick me up at 1.49 in the afternoon, uh, you know, three years from now, you know, at the street corner, I, I trust that my mom would pick me up at 1.49, right? And so, you know, as, as a young kid, you, you rely on that. And it, you, you know, it, uh, it comes through. Be careful what you promise, right? And and if you are going to promise that, people may rely on you for that, and that's a good thing or a bad thing if you if you don't deliver. So, you know. John, curious for you, question right back at you. Some of the biggest learnings that uh, you had from Jeff as a a young entrepreneur yourself. Yeah, I got a, I got a ton, but before I do that, I want to get back to be careful what you promise. Um, I can remember a time, and I think this helped me along my career as well. It's one thing for someone to say, I'm going to do 10 of something this week. And that's their goal for the week. And you're, you're promising you're going to do 10 of something. But the one thing I learned, Jeff, from you that, that I've used throughout my whole career and has been, you know, certainly very impactful to goal setting with uh, people I'm working with is you would always reconfirm. You would always say, John, uh, you're saying 10, but it's Wednesday, Friday's a holiday. And you're saying you're going to do 10. Is that, is that correct? Uh, and you'd get the person to think about it again. You'd get me to think about it and go, oh, maybe 10 is a little too aggressive. I'm going to do eight. But what you'd do is you'd have me reconfirm the goal. So the next week, if I came in and I didn't do eight or I didn't do 10, whatever the goal was set, you would also remind us, like, remember last week when I gave you the chance to reset and you reconfirmed? And I, I thought that was something that I've always been able to, to carry forward in my life as I've been setting goals with people is that reconfirmation of goal increases the level of commitment. Um, I think it I think it's a, it, as a human, we want to we want to do things. We want to make people happy. We often overestimate what we can do or what we want to do or what we're willing to do. We often are optimistic as far as the results of anything. Oh, certainly I can do this. Certainly I can run a you know run a marathon this week. You know, no problem, right? And so I think there's a, a, a bit of a learning as far as setting the expectation that it's, it's okay, like you use the example of 10, right? 10 whatever. Uh, that if you sit there and go, well, I'm only going to do six, but it's well thought out. I think there's some learning in that, you know, to go, you know what? Six is okay. Here's the thought process and here, here's the why. Yeah, absolutely. Um, if, I, if I go on to other things I learned, you know, I, I would say that, you know, when we're first out of college, we've never really trained people before. So I, I felt like training skills was pretty big. 
uh, learning back then and something I learned a lot from the way we used to prepare for training sessions specifically mm -hmm. and preparation that goes into everything. But I'd say probably one of the biggest skills uh, that I've learned was interviewing skills from you and uh, the ability to, you know, really probe deeper than asking the single questions and the way we used to interview candidates for positions in the company was very deep and very profound versus anything I've ever seen uh, through the rest of the companies I've ever worked with before. I tried to carry it forward, but uh, it was very in depth uh, and, uh, and quite a process. I'm assuming you still interview that way today. Uh, yeah, you know what? I think that that becomes a, a, a trait. It's, uh, it's asking why and trying to understand, right? Like we always know, and you, keep, you know, we draw a chart, right? There's the surfacey level stuff, but then you start to go deeper, 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 deeper as to trying to understand people's motivations and their intri intrinsic values. So yes, and it comes out more than just job interviews, it comes out in real life. And everything, yeah, everything, well, it's your point, you're, you're investigating, you're trying to understand something, yep. and you, you keep going deeper to you find the root. Uh, of really what's going on there. I'm assuming, Rich, you still do the same as well in terms of your interactions with people. Yeah, absolutely do uh, in interviewing. One of the negative byproducts, and I'd be curious as to your perspective on it, Jeff, one of the negative byproducts, I think of how we were taught how to interview included not showing emotion to the candidate. Uh, and not showing your cards if you were either excited about them or if you were not excited about them. It was one of the ways that we tested their fundamental ability was to see, hey, under stress, how are they going to perform in front of us? Uh, a negative repercussion of that is it almost built a muscle memory in me to not have as much of a reaction, where even today from time to time, I find myself uh, having to remind myself to smile when I'm excited about something or to look disappointed if I am disappointed because I learned how to hold my cards very close to my vest. I'm curious on your perspective on that, um, no matter where you go with it, if, the, if that's something you've experienced or, or what's your perspective on showing your cards as a leader and showing how you genuinely feel? Uh, and is that a challenge for you? Like, from time to time, it's a challenge for me. You, uh, you mentioned the word muscle memory. And the three of us on this, uh, this webinar have probably done well over a, th a thousand, thousand. We've done thousands of interviews. And you sit there, and, and, and Rich, you're correct. You, you, you know, especially when we first started off, we were interviewing people who were very close to our age. And there's, you know, the, the halo effect where you sit there and you go, ooh, I like this person. They're like me. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm only a couple of years older than them. And, you know, it's very easy to get wrapped up into whether it's storytelling or putting the halo effect on somebody where the halo effect is you're like, I'm like, this person sounds like me, therefore I like them, therefore they'll be successful if I was successful. So... I think when we've done so many interviews and because we had to take that, that little bit of a, of a step back and kind of go, um, I'm interviewing you not to be my friend. I'm interviewing you for a position to figure out if this is going to be something that you're going to be successful at. And again, we gave these people a ton of autonomy and responsibility over tens of thousands of dollars at such a young age, that when you realize the responsibility that you have as an interviewer to sit there and go, am I doing the best thing for this person? You do start to have, as you said, Rich, that, that muscle memory where you do try to become stoic. And I'm sure that that continues on, you know, throughout our, our learned experiences throughout life, where I think we've talked about it before, where uh, there's something called the transition curve again, where basically it's like, you know, how high, high, as I'm, as I'm doing this on the screen, I go, you know, as a catchy, how high and how low are you? Uh, you know, and you're trying to, to ultimately get into a state of balance. And so the balance is, as you know, during the interview, you don't go, ah, that's the best thing. Or like, why, why did you do that? Like, you know, you can't give that reaction. 
<laughs> and I think that you know all of us over a period of time have that uh, that flattening of the the emotions where we don't get as high or, or low. Now, certainly that probably comes into uh, in, into effect and, and probably to a benefit when things are hitting the fan, like 2020, and we all go through some personal hardships. Uh, so yeah, I, I I do relate to that, Rich, as far as you know, you know the the way we we've, we've grew up and learned to interview and ask questions, and then the emotion that you try to sit there and and hold back because it's not about you as the interviewer, it's about them. And so that's, you know, a learned experience. Yeah, I'd love to transition from thinking about interviewing, which is the selection of someone uh, to join a company or an opportunity, and transition that with culture. Now that you are the sole owner of a company, uh, it would, I don't know, you could speak to if it'd be fair to assume that also means that you get to select the culture at some mm -hmm. level or you set the pace on that culture. Can you speak to entrepreneurs who are listening on what's your process on how you go about selecting a culture and maybe even being intentional about it? And then how does that segue with an interview process? And how do you select then for that culture you selected? I think when you say selecting the culture, I think it's important to, to understand that every company or, has a culture, whether you're intentional about it or not. You, are, you can choose what that culture is, or there is a culture that ends up getting chosen for you by your actions and, and your interactions. So I think it's, it's important to understand, uh, first of all, that there is a culture. I am, uh, I'm in the process of interviewing somebody. I interviewed somebody yesterday for a position. And so you then ask about culture. And I go, there, there is a culture associated with, uh, with organizations that, that I work with, especially if I have the authority to have an influence over that culture. And, and part of that culture, or a lot of that culture, goes through my preferences. So to give you an example, I'm not a big meeting person. So the culture of the people I'm around, uh, they know when I'm interviewing them or I talk with them. I'll ask them, you know, what's their thoughts on meetings? Like, and I will talk about there are pluses and minuses of these things. Uh, the culture that, you know, you, you have to be aware of them as a leader and understand, uh, you know, is it, and it normally is more of a gray. It's not normally there, it, whether or not it's a good culture or bad culture. Because you can have a culture that's very regimented and that still be a good culture. And you can have a very regimented culture that, that's a bad culture. If you are in a, a very regimented culture, let's just take the armed forces. That works for them. There are some individuals that may not fit into that culture. And it's probably better off that they know that before getting involved with that culture as opposed to being surprised on day one going, what do you mean somebody's gonna tell me when to get up and you know, when to have breakfast and you know, I have to shave my head and what do you mean I'm going to you know, Afghanistan? Like this, somebody could be shooting at me? You should know those kind of things before you, know, you get involved with those things. So I think it's important that when you're in an organization that as, the, as a leader, that you are true to yourself and uh, true to the people around you saying, this is who I am, this is the culture I am looking for. This is what's important to me. If you're not a fit with that, that's okay. There are plenty of other opportunities and businesses and cultures out there that may be a better fit for you. So I think that being intentional about that culture, realizing that there's no one set culture out there, some businesses out there, they, they have a morning meeting every day at seven o'clock in the morning. That works for them. I'm not a morning person. That won't work for me. I would be a grumpy person, would <laughs> do well with that culture. So I, I think it's, it's understanding, being intentional, and then sharing that with the people you're talking to as far as bringing on board and giving people both sides of that. You know, here's the positive. You know, having no meetings sounds great. What that's going to mean for you, though, is I'm not going to often tell you what to do. 
I'm going to expect you to be able to figure that out yourself. Or if you want meetings, you're going to need to set those up, you know, with other people yourself. So I think, uh, you know, the, the disclosure and understanding who you are and the culture you're trying to create is important. You know, I'd be curious on the meeting side, that not being your preference, I'm sure there are a bunch of people that resonate with that and they go, yeah, me either. I don't want to be in meetings. <laughs> and then there are other people that are, uh, whether you want to call it social or extroverts that probably out meeting their company. Yes. How do you find the middle ground? You personally, how do you find the middle ground? When is having a meeting with more than one person? When is having a meeting necessary in your company? Um, what are the factors you consider? So for me, it's a good question. I would ask this question. Uh, can this be accomplished without a meeting? Like, I, I default more to, why are we having a meeting? Like, why do you need me to be involved with something? What, like, so the good thing I have or opportunity that I have is I, I work with some people that I, uh, that I trust and that are skilled individuals. So they have the autonomy and the authority to make most decisions. I try to sit there and go, I've hired you for a role. I trust you. Uh, you know, you can make that decision. Now, if it was a big issue, like somebody was talking about, like, we're going to get out of our space and we're going to sell you know, footballs. Go, okay, that's a strategic discussion. I should be involved with that. Uh, but I'm more deferring to what's the purpose of a meeting? What's the purpose of, uh, you know, when you come into an office, a lot of times you see around a room, you see a set of a vision and values and, and, you know, you ask yourself the question, uh, you know, do you know what that means? And, and why is that important? And so for, for some people, they get just have a routine, right? This is the way it's always been, or we've always had meetings, or we always have meetings on Mondays. And I would prefer to come in and just almost go the opposite and ask the question, why are we doing any of this stuff? Could it be done more efficiently? So, you know, it, it, it's funny. Now that we're in the Zoom culture, right? At first, we were, I think I've, I'd flown uh, 34,000 miles from, from Jan 1 through to middle of March, right? I was in meetings every other week for conferences, right? So I'm in, we're in franchising, go to a lot of conferences, meet a lot of people. It's a very social thing, right? And then everything stops and nobody knows what to do. And now everybody's going to virtual meetings. And the question I ask is, is why are they running the virtual meetings? Are they running the virtual meetings because they used to run in-person meetings and they just feel it's the right thing to do? Like, are we just continuing to have meetings because we're used to having meetings and used to having conferences? What's, like, could that, could these conferences have gone on and just been canceled? So we all get in these routines. You know, Jeff, it, it's, um... You know, it's funny because I, I, I went back earlier and said the biggest thing I learned from you, one of the biggest things I learned, learned a lot was interviewing skills. And the reason why is I probed down, down, down and, and you interrupted me and you said, well, I basically taught you how to ask the question, why? <laughs> and now that you're going through what you, you just talked about, I'm sitting here going, you know what, you're right. It wasn't interviewing skills because you ask why to everything. Uh, you know, my goal is 10. Why? Why is your goal 10? Why isn't your goal six? Why, you know, why? And, and how are you going to get there? And, and, and where did that come from? Where, where did that, why, 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 why are we having meetings? Why, why do you have those, <laughs> those posters on the wall? You, you seem to be somebody who that's really ingrained in. You're always asking why. And too many times we get in a routine, we just do. We don't ask why. We have, you know, and a lot of entrepreneurs just do. They just do, 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 do. And they don't stop back, look above the trees and go, well, why? Where did that come from? It's, a, it's such a simple question, John, that, uh, you know, just to, to ask the question why, I think that uh, a couple things. One, I'm an introvert, so I prefer to process things internally in my head in quiet space. And, uh, and two, I'll give credit to a couple of my mentors 
uh, you know, Ron Martin, Brian Brown, Rich Wilson back in uh, 1992, when they originally were teaching me uh, interviewing skills, I think they said, just ask the question, why? Right? And it's so easy. So you, you sit there and go, that seems easy to me. I, I, I can remember that, right? That's, that's not too complicated. Uh, so a, as, a, as an introvert and a curious person to understand why people do what they do, uh, it, it's a very simple question that you can keep going. It's easy for you to probe or get a little deeper to understand what are people's intentions or why are they doing something? Is it thought out? Are they thinking or are they following? I, I, I'm pretty sure that I read a book at one point and I can't remember the name of it. If you guys remember it, it'd be great. But it, it talked about, <clears throat> you know, I think it was like five whys or five questions, right? If you ask why five times, <laughs> the root, is that what it was? There was, I, 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 I think there was a book called Why that we read as a, as a, as a team for one of the meetings that we actually did. Yeah, I'll have, to, I'll have to look that up because I, I do feel like that is the, at the root of a lot of things that, that I think we, we sometimes, when you think about an entrepreneur, you know, we talk about the entrepreneur cutting the trees and not cutting up the tree, you know, climbing up the tree and looking at the forest. What we're really asking is why is the entrepreneur asking why more often? Why are we going this way? Uh, so it, it really comes back full circle. And, and that probably is to your point. When, when we were learning interviewing skills, it was really the ability to ask why and probe to get to the root of the question. So I didn't mean to belabor that point, but I think it's very important. Agreed. You know, Jeff, you talked about uh, before becoming a part of College Pro, you had a franchise agreement in front of you and you had mentioned there's a moment where you're kind of scared and then you've got to pick a path. Can you speak to how do you experience that today as an entrepreneur? Can you give an example of maybe a recent decision that you had to make that those feelings, because I think every entrepreneur can relate with the feeling of being a little scared and then having to pick a path. What's a recent time where you felt that and then you had to pick a path and how did you go about determining the right path in the example that you'll give? I'm going to share two things. So I meet with, uh, with people who are considering buying a franchise, uh, probably every six or eight weeks. And I talk about, uh, a, what, what I call a lemonade moment. So I ask them this question. Okay. Uh, and, and all of us may be able to relate to this in, in some way, shape or form. We all have kids. There's going to be a time where you're sitting on your front porch or back porch, wherever, and you're going to be sitting there with a, with a glass of lemonade. Now, it could be a glass of wine, it could be you know, a glass of bourbon, whatever your drink of choice is. And, uh, and your child's going to come up to you and at some point, you know, going to ask you some version of this question. Are you happy with your life? Are you happy with the decisions that you make? And, and I call that the lemonade moment because you're going to sit there and you're going to ponder, right? Or, or, or I will ponder with my, you know, cup of coffee and you're going to go, huh, what do I want to tell my child? Am I happy with the decisions? Do I want to tell my child I took the safe route? Are you going to really be honest and go, I was scared out of my mind. And so I didn't make a lot of decisions. I took the safe route. I took the easy route. And son or daughter, I, I encourage you to do the same. What would you like that advice to be? And I think most people, if you're able to sit there and say, what advice would I like to give my child? It would be, go for it. Follow your dreams. Be happy. So when you frame it into uh, what advice would you give your child or your best friend, if you don't have kids, what, what advice would you give your best friend? And it's always easier. I always joke, joke around and say, you know, I feel like I could solve 
a majority of the world's problems in an hour, right? And convinced I could solve the Middle East problems in under an hour, right? I would go, here's what we're gonna do. This is how we're gonna do it. I have no emotional connection to anything that, that's taken place. So we can look at other people's problems clearly, right? We're not, we don't have the emotional baggage. We don't have the, yeah, but I don't know. You don't understand, blah, blah, blah. You, you're not, it doesn't work for me or my situation. When you don't have that emotional baggage, you don't have uh, the history, you don't have the, uh, you don't understand, it's a lot easier for somebody to look across the table and, and go, here's what you should do. So when I frame that lemonade moment, uh, it's easier for me to go, what advice would I give my child or what would I want them to know? Because I can look back and clearly say, if I, <clears throat> pardon me, if I didn't make that choice, where would I be in life? And I can look back and go, well, I wasn't happy doing what I was doing. So you asked the question um, when, you know, do I still have to make those choices? And I think we all have to make those kind of choices. And some of them aren't big. Like there was a big decision to make, you know, do I buy this business or not? When I left college pro, it was what, what am I going to do? And, you know, the easy thing for me is, is I go, I'm not the best employee. So if you say show up to work at 8.30 in the morning at a downtown office in Chicago, I go, it's probably not the job for me. So I'm able to eliminate a lot of things pretty quickly. So uh, the decision on figuring out, do I buy this business? That was a big decision. Uh, and, and look, we all face big decisions like that all the time. But just, you know, I, I just go back and, and I talk about this lemonade moment now all the time, you know, to, to other people and go, what would you like to tell your kids? If, you're, if your child or your best friend was in that position, what do you wish you'd tell them? What advice would you give them? Yep. You know, they, they, they say if you want to uh, look at it the opposite way, go to any nursing home and ask people, you know, yep. what, their, what their biggest thing is and it's regret. Yep. Regret that they didn't go for it. Regret that they yep. didn't, you know, make some of those moves. And and sometimes, you know, certainly we, you you will make good decisions. You'll make bad decisions, and and you got to live with both those. But at least you've made a decision. Yep. And, and, and you, can, you can say you didn't procrastinate and not make any decision and took take the safe route, which which uh, I agree 100. percent So let's talk about a big decision. You make this big decision to make to to run a business. It's been 10 years now. What has been your biggest learning in that particular business as an entrepreneur? <sighs> Biggest learning. Even when you think you got things figured out, you don't always have things figured out. You know, I, I, I think that uh, lots of things come up. And I think that uh, it, it's a lot easier for everybody to kind of shake their heads in 2020 uh, because so much has, has changed for so many of us. Uh, but we've all probably have those kind of things that have happened to us, whether it's individually, <coughs> pardon me, or through a business over the years in which you can, you can reflect on, on, on 2020 and kind of go, um, when things really hit the fan, uh, what are you made of? And probably the toughest thing, and I think both of you you know this, is uh, it is being an entrepreneur can be very lonely because uh, you know nobody nobody necessarily wants to hear you complain. So uh, so so being able to have that perspective is uh, is important, and uh, and knowing that uh that it can get better and will get better because uh at, at times you know even though you can sit there and go i understand it and i know it like you can sit there and go i know i'm going through the transition curve or i know things are tough and you know i i think things will get better um that probably is the biggest thing that you know over the years where i go um that is so important and then probably the other thing, especially like this year, is, uh, is when you're running a business, um, cash, cash counts. You, you, better, you better have a solution 
if, uh, if, if things really start to go awry, that uh, when you're not part of a big organization and you don't have that bank at your disposal, there are a lot of people who are relying on you uh, to make sure that, uh, that things are going forward. And uh, you better be smart financially. Cash is king. Cash is king. And queen. Steph, can you give an example of something that you've changed your mind on? I learned a long time ago. I remember in 1993, I, uh, I, I went to my boss and I was like, just tell me X. And he's like, you know, I, I can't. And that frustrated me. And uh, he, he said something to the effect of, Jeff, you, you live in black and white. And I'm like, I do. Yes. You know what? Like that helps me. If I'm, if I'm able to grab a hold of something <clears throat> and know it to be a fact, or if you say the goal is going to be 20 next year, whatever we're talking about, uh, I can wrap my mind around that and I can adjust. And uh, what I learned was, was that it, it, it's great. So when you ask the question, like, what have you changed your mind about? It, it's interesting because I would go, what I try to do now is try to keep an open mind on a lot of things. So I try not to live in absolutes. And I think we, we're in a world right now where you see a lot of people living in absolutes. And, you know, I, I think it's a, uh, I, I think it's uh, a skill but also good listening to people sit there and go ask this question. Can you comfortably put yourself on and understand both sides of an argument? And you see it right now in politics where you would go, doesn't appear that a lot of people can do so. So uh, when you ask me, you know, have I changed my mind? I struggle with a little bit because, uh, you know, the tough thing on that is, is, is do I have my mind made up on a lot of things? Yeah, that can, that can get really deep, Jeff, when you think about it. As an entrepreneur and you think about why you keep asking why, 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 ultimately, it probably isn't a good practice for entrepreneurs to have biases on certain things in their business yeah. or as people that have certain biases on things in life. Uh, because things are very gray and that's a reason why people see things different ways. And if you can be an entrepreneur that doesn't see things in absolutes, you see things a little more gray, you will ask more why questions. And ultimately that will guide you to the right direction, even if it's not an absolute. It, you, and John, yes, I, I believe that to be true. And I believe that when you're an entrepreneur, you're, you're leading an organization. And if you have any level of success, if you sit there and go, I did A, B, and C, and that got me to, to a level of success. It's easy over time to go, well, the key to the success is I keep doing A, B, and C. And I think the challenging thing is to look at it and go, why are we not doing X, Y, and Z? And people would go, because A, B, and C works. A, B, and C works always until it doesn't. And, you know, I, I, I always say this, at the, you know, when we're talking about, uh, when we're talking to candidates, I said, you know, I, I would hate to be the taxi industry waking up one day asking, how do you spell Uber? Because their world changed. So we know the world's going to change. Right? We always don't know how it's going to change, right? Like nobody predicted, you know, we're all sitting in Zoom meetings <laughs> and that everybody's going to wear face masks over. And what is that going to mean? So uh, the challenging thing is, is when you go, you know, what have you changed your mind on? I try to push myself to go keep an open mind. And don't just have my perspective and go, what I've done is going to work. Because there's, you know, too much in history where you sit there and go, tell me something that has worked consistently for a hundred years that hasn't changed fishing hooks there you go oh, sorry <laughs> i didn't know I, I didn't know it was a rhetorical question <laughs> do they when they have these like salmon farms are they using fishing hooks rich no there's like you know fishing farms oh, they, 
<laughs> you know, I'm not surprised about that answer. A wise man once told me, and the wise man is you, um, that the higher up you go in leadership, the more gray things become. And you have to get comfortable in the gray. And while normally you'd feel comfortable in the black and white, it's a yes or it's no. It's clear what's right and what's wrong. And if you want to aspire to greater leadership positions, you're going to need to learn how to get comfortable in the gray. One of the things that I have found myself doing to get comfortable in the gray is being willing to contradict myself mm -hmm. in the spirit of pursuing the best answer, in the spirit of pursuing the truth. I feel like one of the things that I learned from you, I'm sure, in my late teens, early 20s, is the ability to speak confidently, either privately or with a group. And I find that actually shuts down creativity with people who I'm trying to be creative with. So I have found a really comfortable way for me, uh, despite speaking confidently, that if they can see that I'm willing to contradict what I just said, that they can contradict what I just said. Mm -hmm. And now we can have a collaborative conversation to get to something that is the absolute best solution. So I'm not entirely surprised that that was your answer. And that's something that you taught me, as a matter of fact. Well, you mentioned the word conversation. And the question is, is when, when people are, are having a conversation, are you having a conversation to understand? Are you seeking to understand? Or are you seeking to try to convince that person of your thoughts and your beliefs? And that's a challenge. And, you know, both of you are uh, very good listeners. And also, both of you are very much open to a debate. And sometimes because you're like, I'm intellectually stimulated by, <laughs> by the debate, or I'm intellectually stimulated to see if I can get under this person's skin. And it's something that, uh, that the three of us have shared throughout the years is being able to have long drawn out discussions uh, about anything uh, with people just taking the opposite approach and just kind of being able to go, you know, it's a skill, it's entertainment, but, uh, but also to, to be able to sit there and go, you know, it's something I think all of us have enjoyed at some point. Um, I think again, Rich, to, to your point there though, you know, having a conversation is, is important and being able to listen. And you're right, I do believe that, uh, that the higher up you get in an organization, it's lonelier and you, it's very easy for a leader, I don't have a boss, right? It's very easy for me to go, I've got, the, I've got the answers and it's my way. I have the authority to do that, given title, given ownership. I don't feel comfortable in doing that because that's just uh, me shutting the organization down and going, you know, it's my way. So the challenge I have is, is you know, how can I, uh, how can I try to make generally neutral to allow the best ideas to surface. And then my part of my role is to sit there and, and ask questions, not to be annoying, but to ask questions to go, have you thought about the other side? Or we think, you know, what are we missing? And then trying to live a little bit more uh, comfortably in that gray area. Hey, Jeff, in closing, some thoughts that I have just to share with you. You mentioned um, somebody believing enough in you and just want to take a public opportunity and thank you for believing enough in me as a college student to bring me on as a franchisee when you were a general manager, to bring me on as a general manager when you were a vice president, to then bring me on again at CertiPro Painters when uh, you came over to CertiPro from College Pro. And my whole life long, the only thing that I've experienced from you is you believing in me and uh, working hard at conversation and working with me to help me become the best leader that I can become. So thank you for that. Of course. My, look, my pleasure. You, you made my life easier, Rich. So, you know, you, you did all the hard work. <laughs> from time to time, I made it easier. And from, from the one, true, from true. one who maybe made your life harder at some point. <laughs> <laughs> no, John, you definitely made my life harder. <laughs> Rich made my life easier. You, you made my life harder, John. Hey, that's all good, though. That's, that was part of my in role. In a good way. That was part of my role in, in, in kind of that development phase, you know. But, uh, you know, hey, I, I, I want to mimic everything that, that Rich just said. Thank you for everything you've done for us. Certainly, you never forget, you know, you're first at things and you were our first boss, first mentor, still a mentor today. And 
certainly a lot of the business skills I developed over time were really rooted in, in the, the mentorship you gave us and, and the college pro philosophies and core values and leadership skill development and all that kind of stuff. So I can't thank you enough for coming and joining us today and appreciate the conversation. I appreciate it, John. And look, to, to watch the two of you be as successful as you are and, and as skilled as you are in, in your ventures, I've, uh, look, I've, I've uh, appreciated being able to watch and uh, see you guys grow and then not only just grow, but kick some ass out there because you guys are, uh, are both very skilled uh, and respected individuals out in the, in the world, in the business world. And you're, you're, you know, like I, I appreciate the friendship and, and have, uh, you know, appreciated you guys going out there and uh, go into such high levels of, uh, of success out in the field. It's been a joy to watch. And well, that, that has nothing to do with me. That's, that's all about you guys. Well, thanks for the head start you gave us. Yep. Thanks, Jeff.